Hey guys, this is Joe Ferlini, West Point class of 2016, currently studying applied neuroscience at King's College London. I wanted to take a minute to talk about a theory that I've been working on. As some of you may know, I've been living with chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis for the last five years or so. And it's an incredibly frustrating condition to have. For whatever reason, the research and the medical community have not really met eye to eye and done a very uh, eloquent handoff to each other. That area of research in medicine where they, where they meet is called translational medicine and currently there's a struggle to, to um, implement research findings of many diseases in, into medicine. So I say this all to to introduce the theory, a theory that I've been working on um, for the chronic fatigue and myalgic encephalomyelitis uh, community. There's a couple of known causes of the condition. Most of the time, this condition, ME-CFS, is triggered by some sort of viral, um, some sort of viral infection. So whether that's Epstein-Barr virus or um, as we're currently learning now, uh, coronavirus, um, there seems to be a very similar onset and insidious set of symptoms that um, become chronic symptoms after the acute infection has been resolved within, within the human body. So I myself, there's a lot more to the backstory of how I got here but fundamentally, as I look in retrospect, it appears that the predominant onset cause of my chronic fatigue syndrome was uh, brought on by an acute Epstein-Barr virus infection. I was exposed to the virus in the winter of 2015, and I had classic um, you know, Epstein-Barr mononucleosis symptoms um, and test results um, in the months following. The condition does have a, a slightly longer incubation rate than, <clears throat> excuse me, than some other viruses. So you wouldn't really expect to see symptoms until after the first couple of weeks, sometimes over a month from your exposure to, to the virus. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna post a photo, a, a chart that I've, I've created along with this video and really just try to piece together all of these symptoms and seemingly obscure and random systemic uh, issues that that stem off of the initial onslaught of chronic uh, insult of chronic fatigue syndrome and then hopefully start to see how that all makes sense and how you know we actually how we can actually describe the condition better and how hopefully we're able to um, go back and begin to treat the condition uh, more effectively. As of right now, MECFS does not have a singular FDA approved treatment. Uh, it doesn't have a standard, standard set of medications um, or therapies that are applied. There's constant alterations to the guidelines given by the Center for uh, Infectious Diseases. Some are hurtful, uh, some have been hurtful in the past, some of those recommendations, but thankfully we're coming to a place where we're starting to learn a bit more about how different everybody's uh, case is. So I'm going to start off at the beginning. Um, this is just one way chronic fatigue syndrome can begin. And so we're gonna look at it from this Epstein-Barr virus perspective. Fundamentally, Epstein-Barr virus is a viral infection. One of the uh, key hallmarks of the condition is a enlarged spleen. This is due to the spleen's uh, role in the regulation and the processing and detoxification of dead viral uh, DNA and cells that are, is basically the, the cleanup crew um, of the human body. The lymph nodes collect 
this cellular waste from the virus and kind of shovels it all down towards the spleen. And so um, because of this, the spleen in cases of mono infectious mononucleosis um, can be enlarged. And so one of the things to think about with the spleen enlargement is um, its effect on the vagus nerve. The, the vagus nerve innervates a, a major, uh, majority of organs in in the thoracic area. It is a it's a cranial nerve. It's it's one of the major cranial nerves, predominantly responsible for parasympathetic response in the human body. So the nervous system has two major roles. You could think of it as the fight or flight response and the rest and digest response. We know that it is a little more advanced than that, um, but in the most simple terms, that's the way we can think about it. And so parasympathetic response with the nervous system is, is, is regulated by the vagus nerve. And so what that is, is it calms you down. It, it sends um, signals to the brain and to the body regarding the state of infection and inflammation. And based on these basic, these basic functions and how it innervates the heart, the nerves, or sorry, excuse me, the lungs, the digestive system, and the spleen, we can begin to see how this possibly could have some sort of involvement in the systemic symptoms that are experienced uh, in post-viral fatigue syndromes. Uh, given this information, there's a previous theory that the vagus nerve uh, becomes infected during this, um, you know, during this post-acute virus period. I don't tend to think that that's entirely necessary in order to have the dysfunction in the vagus nerve and the follow-on symptoms resultant of that. It, it, it seems to me as if um, the inflammation in the spleen, which we know is present due to its swelling in size, which is evident in imaging and even palpation, that inflammation of the vagus nerve alone could be possible because of its uh, innervation of the spleen. And basically this is the fundamental ideology and hypothesis of now how the rest of these uh, aspects become involved. From here, we can immediately identify the uh, dysautonomia um, that can occur through dysfunction of the vagal nerve. If the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system is not counterbalancing the sympathetic nervous system, you're in for a bad time. Um, symptoms like heart palpitations, um, POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, low blood pressure, um, and difficulty ma managing and regulating body temperature. These things would be considered types of dysautonomia. And when the, the vagal nerve is not functioning properly to communicate via the brain, to these organs, um, we have some of those symptoms and, and issues become present. You know, changes in cardiac function as well um, are very common in, in folks with post-viral fatigue syndrome. So from here, another branch of the vagal nerve's function is regarding the communication about the state of sickness in the body. So uh, the vagal nerve, when you're sick, your immune system is producing inflammatory chemicals and these inflammatory chemicals are primarily um, signaling chemicals. They tell other parts of the immune system, hey, here's where the trouble is, you know, send more help. And the more inflammation is in one spot, the easier it is for different aspects of the immune system to identify where the trouble is and where to send um, cleanup crews like, you know, the white blood cells in order to then process this, the cellular waste of the virus and send it back to the spleen. So because of this malregulation, the immune system becomes stuck in this sort of state of chronic inflammation. And uh, basically the, the brain interprets that as the body is in a constant state of sickness. And this is, this is probably where most um, people with ME-CFS are able to relate is with the uh, immune dysregulation. Immune dysregulation results in things like uh, allergies and mast cell activation syndrome where um, the mast cells are become hypersensitive or 
uh, leaky and will release chemicals uh, such as histamines when exposed to I guess, subnecessary levels uh, for a normal person uh, as what it would take to, to trigger those uh, cell response. For a lot of people that struggle there, this, this could be a reason why. Additionally, the, cons the chronic immune response immediately means a, a chronic inflammatory response as well. And so I'd say that these are probably the two largest um, functioning uh, issues that, that we see. Chronic inflammatory response is evidence in everyday um, activities from walking to sleeping to eating to thinking exercising all of these things generate mild levels of inflammation that where inflammation as a as a as a chemical signal in a normal healthy person will aid the body in in these processes when you work out and you create low levels of inflammation it signals to the body hey come here we need we, we need more resources here to repair however in a person with chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis, these signals become over amplified and it recruits more inflammatory messengers and it becomes overwhelmingly difficult for the body to clear those those inflammatory chemicals and the damage done by the inflammation. We see this now in you know, with symptoms like post-exertional malaise in the cognitive dysfunction, difficulties with memory, difficulties processing information, difficulty with planning and decision-making. Those things become difficult due to uh, the additional inflammation and, and strain on the brain and the competition for energy sources uh, throughout the body to um, compensate and to make up for the additional burden. We're getting a more and more clear picture of how this sort of devolves um, linearly as well as tangentially. And then we start to see how some of these symptoms, in fact, once we're down this line a little bit, begin to have cyclic effects and have negative feedback loops with each other, causing the continual propagation of these symptoms. And so an example of that is because of the chronic inflammation whether that's cytokines or histamine from mast cell activation, there's evidence to believe that that can cause weakening of connective tissues. And connective tissues are, are present in all parts of the body. Uh, you know, you predominantly would think the joints, you know, lig ligaments, um, but it's also found like in your skin, uh, within your heart wall, your connective tissue inside of your abdominal muscles that connect them, uh, you know, together. And so, Folks who have been typically diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome may, this could be a potential cause of it or it could be a potential side effect of it, but they're not to be ignored. Um, I, I believe that they would fall somewhere within this, within this chart as well. And so when you start to have damage to the connective tissues, there's a very important purpose to the connective tissues, and that's basically the glue that holds your body together. If you begin to have those issues in your cervical region, you have instability in your neck, particularly within your atlas and upper cervical vertebrae, and you have upper cervical instability, you've just opened up a whole bunch of other potential problems that you haven't had before. Upper cervical instability is connected with intracranial hypertension, difficulty in the, in the transference of cerebral spinal fluid flow, impingements of cranial nerves, as well as um, encroachments of the brainstem, and then also decreased vascular functioning of the main arteries that feed the brain. And so all of these things in combination you know, we'll go back to, to reinforce the dysautonomia in this sort of cyclic, the cyclic manner. Like given all of these things together, it seems that our approach to the treatment of this condition is really, it's obviously, it's not helping. And I believe that it's, it's, it's incorrect in, in its nature of, of how we are approaching it. You know, you go to any one singular doctor in Western medicine, and in their, the medical system is designed for them to look at a specific, one specific system. It's designed to look at the symptoms of that specific symptom, treat the symptoms, you know, make the symptoms go away so that you don't think about the condition anymore. It's, it's difficult because nobody wants to feel poorly. 
nobody wants to feel sick. And so in, in a lot of instances, this is a very helpful tool, but in a chronic illness, it does not fix the root cause of the problem. And in fact, it, it can perpetuate other aspects of that chronic problem. We have you know, specialists treating symptoms and all of these peripheral branches of, of this chart, they're treating the symptoms. But what I, what I propose is that we need to really focus on those first three or four steps of the evolution of, of this condition. Focus on the viral infection and, and the remnants and uh, remaining antibodies related to that virus that remain in the human body. Um, focus on, on reintegrating the, the vagal nerve uh, to reinforce the vagal tone and resume appropriate function of the you know, the autonomic autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous parasympathetic nervous system. I think that by fo by focusing on on these th couple of things and the down regulation of the immune system in general, we'll begin to see an overall decrease in you know, symptom presentation for patients that uh, are living with chronic fatigue syndrome uh, as per a viral cause. We see uh, you know some of the some of the on the cusp treatments that are discussed and used by patients like like low dose naltrexone we see some patients trying valocyclovir or valtrex and then common antiviral medication and then things that are not medications but that are physical treatments such as vagal nerve stimulation uh, which has been around for a very long time it's just not currently studied thoroughly and, and approved for for conditions like uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis but I think if we begin to go to, you know, we go back to basics and we look at, we look at how did we get here in the first place? Um, and we treat the root cause of the symptoms. I think that we're gonna find a lot more progress and rehabilitation of patients who have been living with this condition for years and years and years, um, as, as many do, um, or at least find some type of remission uh, or improvement in the symptoms. I, I don't think I've talked to any single person who has lived with this that wouldn't, you know, wouldn't want a day of relief. As we all know, coronavirus has, has been very influential in the way that we've lived for the last almost, you know, year and a half now. I try to look at the bright side of things. One benefit, you know, one positive to come out of this all is the additional research that has been done on post-COVID syndrome. Post-COVID syndrome in reality is extremely similar to your typical post-viral fatigue syndrome that's labeled as ME-CFS. It's extraordinarily similar and we have to we have to study why that is. We have to look deeper into uh, what biochemical and physiological processes are happening to make those conditions so similar. And I think that we're gonna find a lot of overlap um, in this chronic immune activation as well as uh, chronic inflammatory response uh, in, in the body um, post, post experiencing uh, viruses uh, like this. So, you know, that is one thing that I, I'm grateful for. I'm looking forward to see the results of those studies. And yeah, I mean, this is, this is the mile high view of the topic. Um, obviously there's a lot more to go into every single you know, crisscross and uh, arrow in, in this hypothetical chart that I've discussed um, has a, a extraordinarily in-depth explanation and deserves an extraordinarily in-depth explanation. And so over the next period of time, I will continue to focus and um, try my best to explain those conne those connections uh, in more detail. Ultimately, I would like to publish a journal article regarding this topic it needs more visibility. Um, we need to change the way that we're looking at uh, chronic illness in general. And, uh, you know, we need to encourage our healthcare system to, you know, to focus on health in the first place and also to focus on care. You know, without that, we don't have a healthcare system. And uh, those two things are critically important to supporting not just patients who have acute injuries or illnesses, but also keeping in mind all of those who are sick for years and years and years um, and need a different type of support that is equally as important. So that's basically it. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk while I'm sitting in my car. Uh, I seem to do my best thinking while I'm in my car. And uh, yeah, please, please, if you have any questions about this kind of stuff, comments, uh, um, 
send me a message, send me a text. Um, I love thinking about it. I love talking about it and I love researching it because it's really important information. And lastly, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm also not a doctor. So none of, <laughs> nothing that I have discussed is medical advice. I uh, just have to put that out there. It's, it's uh, science education and it will always be uh, you know, science and health education. So take care. I'll see you guys later. Thanks for sticking around this long if you did. I'll catch you on the flip side.